Hi, Michael. Hi, Ernesto. Namaskaram. Today we're going to discuss the, the second Mangalam verse of Fula Dunarpadu. Yeah, and we're going to analyze and ask uh, some questions to, uh, to go deep into this, this verse. So, uh, Michael, won't you, what would you say uh, to, uh, about this verse? Right. Namaskaram. When Bhagavan first wrote this uh, uh, second Mangalam verse, it wasn't actually intended to be a Mangalam verse. It was somewhere, it was part of the main text, somewhere later in the work. The reason it later got added, it was later decided to include it as a Mangalam verse, is that when Bhagavan and Murugana thought they had completed Uludunapadu, um, it was shown to Kavyaganta. And he first objected about the Mangalam verse, saying, why is it just two lines when all the other verses are four lines? So then Bhagavan added the first two lines of the first Mangalam verse. But then Kavyaganta said, but the Mangalam should always be a, a prayer or should always mention at least God. But there's no mention of God here at all in this Mangalam verse. How is this appropriate? Actually, what Bhagavan is talking about in the first Mangalam verse is Uludu, what actually exists. That is the reality of God. That's what God actually is. So God is mentioned there, but not as a personal God. But anyway, Kavirantha then looks through the rest of the work, and he found this verse in which Bhagavan has used the name, the word Mahesan. Mahesan means the great Lord. It um it, it implies God, but it particularly is a name of Shiva, is Mahesan. So he thought, ah, here's a, a name of God. This is a, a more appropriate uh, verse to have as a Mangalam. So he suggested that this would be the proper verse to have as a Mangalam. So Murugana and uh, Bhagavan and Murugana then discussed the idea, and Bhagavan said, okay, the, um, the first verse deals with uh, bichara. This deals with surrender. So um, we can take this as a second Mangalam verse, just to satisfy Kavirantha. So this was made the second Mangalam verse. And Bhagavan composed another verse to, um, to make up a 40 in the main text. Um, this verse is in a sense autobiographical. Bhagavan is talking about his own experience here um, without saying it, but it's his own experience. But knowing his, um, the story of his life, we can, we can uh, in infer that though Bhagavan expresses this in a very impersonal way, this is actually his own experience. What he says in this verse, um, it, the, the, the first the, the, the verse begins marana baya mikku ulla am makal um makal means people am makal could be taken as those people because a, a can be a, is a um is a demonstrative prefix but in this case that is not what is meant am also means um beautiful so it literally, Ammakal means beautiful people. What the beauty that Bhagavan is referring to here is, um, is, is purity of mind and heart. So what he implies, that though the, the literal meaning of Ammakal is beautiful people, it implies pure-hearted people, people with a pure mind and heart. Um, uh, and and he he what does he say about those people? They are mar, marana baya mikkulla. Mik, ulla means who have in this context. Uh, mikku means uh, intense or very great. Um, marana baya marana baya means fear of death. So uh, marana baya mikkulla ammakal means pure-hearted people who have intense fear of death. So that is the subject. Um, then the next uh, two words are aranaha. Aran means a fortress. Aha means as, as a fortress. Um, uh, then he says, uh, marana uh, baba mila mahesan. 
of a great lord, Mahesan, who is devoid of birth and death, uh, in other words, the deathless and birthless uh, great lord, Charanamei Saba. Uh, Charanamei means uh, his uh, feet, the feet of the lord. So they, uh, Saba, uh, uh, the superficial meaning of Saba is he, they reach or they join the, the feet of the lord. But uh, here, Saba is used in the sense of taking refuge. Taking refuge implies surrendering. When we surrender completely to him, we take refuge in him. So though the word surrender is not explicit here, what Saba uh, implies here is surrender. So those, it's a, a, pure heart, a pure hearted person gets an intense fear of death they will take refuge in the feet of the birthless and deathless Lord. And they will take refuge in his feet as a fortress. That is, if you, if you go to a, if your life is in danger and you go to a strong person uh, to protect you, uh, you, that strong person becomes a fortress, a fortress in the sense of a, a place of safety, a place of protection. So they take refuge in him, in his feet, as their fortress. Um, what Bhagavan is saying here, though it, it is, seems to be said in a more theistic language, more, more uh, he, he refers to Mahesh and God, and taking refuge in the feet of God, actually in practice what he talks about here is exactly the same that he talked about in the first Mangalam verse. Because what does Bhagavan mean when he talks about the feet of Mahesan? Bhagavan often used to say the feet of God or God or God's feet are what is always shining in our heart as I. That is, the term feet is used a lot in, um, in, uh, in devotional literature, Indian uh, the Indian devotional literature, whether you're talking about whether it's in Sanskrit or in any other language, um, the, the feet means God Himself. But why the feet is emphasized is the feet of the lowest part. So we are taking we are because we are subsiding, we are sinking down, we are bowing down to Him. It's His feet we touch. Um, so to have his feet on our head symbolizes the crushing of ego. Um, so taking refuge in his feet means we, we are subsiding we, with all humility. We are surrendering completely to him. Um, when, how can ego subside? How can ego take refuge in the feet of God? That is in, explained by Bhagavan in so many other places. We take refuge by subsiding. And the way to subside, because Mahesan, the great Lord, is that which is always shining in our heart as I. So we can take refuge in his feet only by subsiding uh, and dissolving back into the source from which we rose, because he is the source from which we rose. So... Uh, taking refuge in him means subsiding. How can we bring about the subsidence of ego? As Bhagavan made clear, ego will subside to the extent to which we attend to ourselves. To the extent to which we attend to anything other than ourselves, ego rises, stands, and flourishes. This is what Bhagavan implies, for example, in verse 25 of Uludunapadu, where he in, in which he describes ego as a formless phantom. And he says uh, about that formless phantom ego, grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes abundantly. Leaving form, it grasps form. So the very nature of ego is to grasp form. Since ego is a formless phantom, Grasping form means grasping things other than itself. And it grasps them by attending to them, by being aware of them. So ego cannot rise, stand, or flourish 
without grasping form. So if instead of grasping form, if it tries to grasp itself, what happens? Since it is a formless phantom, if it tries to grasp itself, it will subside and merge back into its source. Um, this is what Bhagavan implies by in the, in the next sentence in which he says, Te dinal o tumpidicum. Yeah, I'm talking, still talking about verse 25, that is. Uh, Te dinal o tumpidicum. Te dinal o tumpidicum means if sought, and it implies if ego investigates itself, o tumpidicum means it will take flight, it will run away. That is, if ego investigates itself, it will dis subside and dissolve back into its source. That is the implication. So the only way, to, so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves, we are feeding and nourishing ego. If we try to attend to ourselves alone, ego will thereby subside and dissolve back into its source. So the only way we can surrender ourselves completely is by being self-attentive. And being self-attentive is what Bhagavan referred to in the previous verse as um, being in the heart as it is. So though he's using different, he, he's describing it in a very different way, the surrender that he's describing in this verse is the same as the Brahma Dhyana, the meditation on Brahma, the, the meditation on what it actually exists, that he talks about in the previous verse. We can meditate on what actually exists, only by being as it is. Likewise, we can surrender ourselves to God only by being as we actually are, by subsiding back into our source. So that is what he implies by this first sentence. Why he emphasizes uh, this, why he says ammaka, uh, pure, as I said, am means beautiful, but it implies pure-hearted. Why does he single out pure-hearted people? Because what happens to most of us when the fear of death comes, we fear to be separated from all the things we hold dear, our family, our possessions, our social status, our, our wealth, or whatever it may be. We, whatever we are attached to, whatever we, uh, whatever seems to us to give value to our life, those are the things we're attached to. And so when fear of death comes, the mind will go out and try to grasp those things. So a, a worldly person, when the fear of death comes, they'll, their mind will go outwards. And because they're thinking of all these worldly things, very quickly the thought of the thought the fear of death will go away and they'll just be thinking of whatever they are attached to. In the case of mature souls, because they are free of attachment, when the fear of death comes, they won't what they what they will fear what they are fearing is not the loss of um is not separation from their relatives or their friends or their wealth or anything else. What they are concerned about is when death, when this body dies, do I also die? In other words, that the only thing they're concerned about is their own existence. Does my exist? This body is going to cease to exist. Do I cease to exist along with this body? When, uh, because of this intense fear, they take refuge in the feet of the Lord. That means they turn their mind inwards to seek the reality of I. That is surrendering ourselves to God. When we turn our mind inwards, then we find that then ego subsides and merges back into its source. And then we experience ourselves as the deathless spirit, but is never affected even to the slightest extent by the, the birth or death of a body. So this is the implication. And then he says uh, uh, in the next sentence, um uh, tam sabodu uh, tam sabu utra tam sab sab sabu uh, means in this context it, by sabu means uh, refuge but in this context it implies surrender so by their refuge in other words by taking refuge in his feet or by surrendering to him um uh 
the word he uses actually is not by, he says odu. Odu means with, with their surrender. But it implies odu is used here in an instrumental sense. So it implies by, by their surrender, tam sabu utra. That sabu means death. Uh, utra means they achieve or they, uh, they gain death. In other words, they die. So by their refuge, they undergo death. Um, uh, so they here means what by 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 surrendering completely, ego dies. That is the implication. Um, uh, and having died, they become deathless. It is implied by the next sentence because in the next sentence he said, "Sabadava, uh, those who are uh, uh, deathless, sabu enum." Uh, Sabaro, will they, will those who are deathless be associated with the thought, thought of death? That is, if, 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 in the case of mature souls, when the intense fear of death comes, their mind turns within to take refuge in the feet of the Lord, and by doing so, they die. That means ego dies, and when ego dies, we rem what remains is that which is death, which is immortal, that which is deathless. The, 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 um, the Marana Baba Maha Mahesan, who is actually what we, who is what we actually are. So that alone remains. We remain as that Mahesan. So we become deathless. So Bhagavan says, why would those who are deathless be associated with the thought of death? That is, the thought of death will come to us only so long as we take ourselves to be the body. When, the, when we surrender ourselves, we thereby separate ourselves from the body and remain as we actually are. When we remain as we actually are, what we actually are is beyond all thoughts. Not only thought of death, beyond all thoughts. So um, there's no question of any thought of death or any fear of death arising in those who have died to ego by surrendering themselves to God. That is the implication of this verse. Uh, uh, do you have any questions you want to ask about this? No, it's so, so clear. Yeah, well, I, um, I would say that, um, uh, for example, in, in, in Guru Bachaka Kovei, in, in verse uh, 228, yes, where it says, uh, uh, let me see, I have it here. Uh, it says, can immortality be obtained unless the one who takes this body as I dies as self, having become afraid of this body's death and having therefore inquired who is this I? And implied in between brackets, no. Yeah. So in, in that, it, it sounds as if it, you say that it, it's an uh, autobiographical, no? We could interpret yes. the, this verse. But here it, it seems like Morogana is saying that it's like almost inevitable to feel that fear of death to, I mean, uh, anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, having I, become afraid, not only Vagavan, but I mean, yeah. uh, this is the, uh, we have to go through it. Yeah, uh, all of that, it. All. that's why Bhagavan says those pure-hearted souls. He says it in a general way, but it is, it is what happened in his case. Mm -hmm. that, in that sense, I say it's autobiographical, but it's not only, um, uh, it's not only um, referring to him, it's referring to any mature soul. Yeah, so uh, all mature souls, as you say, ultimately have, have to yeah. come to this path to end the uh, Yes, the search in all souls uh, as they get matured enough. Yes, have to go through that fear of death. In, yes, in, and yeah. it's only from our perspective that we can say it is autobiographical, because the one who, who's, uh, the, the one who had that fear of death, died, as Bhagavan says, by their surrender they die, they attain death. So. Uh, uh, the ego that had that intense fear of death and therefore turned within, thereby died. So Bhagavan is already dead. So there's no, there's no, e there's no one left to say anything autobiographical. But from our perspective, 
it it seems to be autobiographical because we know that in the case of Bhagavan, it was that intense fear of death that triggered that final, but that was the final, um, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the final nudge he required to turn within. He means that ego that was identifying itself as I am, I, I am Ben Suraman. As soon as that ego turned within, it thereby merged back into its source by seeing itself as it actually is, thereby ceased to be ego. And what remained then, that is the, the soul reality. That is what we, our, our own real self then shone through. Our own real self means Atma Swarupa, the real nature of our self. That alone is what shone through. So what we take to be Bhagavan, that is, in our view, Bhagavan seems to be a person. But there's actually no, no ego there at all. So what is shining through that, that, uh, that person uh, whom we call Ramana Maharshi or Bhagavan, mm -hmm. that what was shining through that body is only Atma Swarupa itself, only our own reality. We are seeing ourselves in that form. He appeared, and our, our real nature appeared in that form in order to tell us the term within. It makes sense because it's, I mean, ego has to, if it's going to be eradicated in the end, it's going to disappear. It's going, it's have to, it has to fear its own death. It has to fear yes. that yes. fear because yes. otherwise, because we see, well, I've heard uh, uh, so-called uh, enlightened teachers, no, that say yes. that yes. they had an experience of, uh, enlightenment or so on and in in places like no i talked to ernesto about it once like in a park where everything is beautiful in in a moment of bliss having a moment of bliss or yeah. having no but uh, if it's the, the eradication of ego it's, it makes sense that it's it has to fear it. <laughs> yes 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 that no? is what is the nature of ego as bhagavan says in verse 25 of Urunaptu, a grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes. Leaving form, it grasps form. So grasping form is the very nature of ego. So ego, ego is not reluctant to let go. So finally, when it's faced with its own destruction, naturally, it will be accompanied by an intense fear. But that intense fear will be the... The, the final push required to turn within and surrender itself completely. That in order to be free of death, in order to escape death, we need to, we need to surrender. But by surrendering, we will die. That is, we are trying to, because we now take ourselves to be the body, we try to avoid the death. We, we, out of, because of our identification with the body, the fear of death arises, because the body we all know is going to die. Mm -hmm. when, 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 if that fear of death drives our mind to turn within, we thereby die, not the body dies, ego dies. Um, so it, it is... Uh, Yes, it's very natural, but at the final stage where we, we're finally faced with the choice of surrendering or not surrendering, that intense fear will be there. But we overcome that fear by turning within, by surrendering ourselves completely. That means giving up our holds on all other things. When, when, you, when you surrender yourself, you, you completely give, your, you give yourself wholly to the one to whom you are surrendering. So all our desires, our attachments, our concern about this body, concern about the person we seem to be, we leave all these things behind. We take refuge wholly in him. That's a, that's a, a poetic or a metaphorical way of saying we, let, we cease attending to anything outside. We attend only to that which is always shining in our heart as I. It is like um, the last thunder in, in the storm, no? That the, the, the field that the ego creates is that this, this, this is the end. And, yes. and after that, the sun shines and yes. the, it, it was not the end. No, no. <laughs> but, but, but the ego creates that this yes. incredible well, it, of, of it, the finish. 
it's the end of ego, but once ego is ended, we find there never was any ego, so there never was either a beginning or an end. Hmm. Until then, it's all, it's all a preparation. The purification of the mind is just a path of preparation to that moment. Where, exactly, exactly. Where the love to just to find out whether we are existing after our bodily death yeah. is overrides the, the fear to go out. Yes. The death of ego happens in a moment, not even a moment, it just happens. And it, it's instantaneous. Mm -hmm. But in order to prepare ourselves for that, in order to make ourselves willing to surrender ourselves completely, so much preparation is necessary. The preparation being this simple practice of self-investigation, holding on to self-attentiveness, because it's only by holding on to self-attentiveness that we can slowly wear away, the, uh, that is, we can weaken and eventually uh, free ourselves from all the vasanas that draw our mind outwards. And another thing that is, uh, well, um, I said, uh, you said the Bhagavan said that uh, uh, we live as if we're not going to die, right? Yes. Because, uh, well, deep in our hearts, we know that uh, we cannot be inexistent. Yes. So, but, uh, well, at least when nothing, when nothing is threatening our lives, no? Yes. <laughs> I, yes. I guess because, because if something is threatening our life, uh, or, or also to feel hypochondria, for example, no, it's yeah. the anxiety of our own health state. Yeah. Uh, in that case, in those times, we don't feel that we feel that we are bound to, <laughs> yeah, we are yeah. bound and going to die. And in that, there is like a switch, no, we live as if, uh, yeah, we're not going to die because uh, my own reality, I know that I'm real in a sense, there is a real element in me. Yeah. I, even though I'm unaware of it, but in the uh, when we face a disease or something, we feel vulnerable, and then it's like the reality of our body sets in, kicks in, and yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a switch, like in in a. It's a, a it, yeah. It it can be a wake up call. That yeah. is normally we because we because we've got a sense of immortality because we've got deep down. We know ourselves to be immortal, but because we ex identify ourselves as I am this body, in other words, because we're aware of ourselves as this body, it seems to us as if this body is going to live forever. Even though we all know very well we're going to die one day, it, it's hard for the, the thought of our own death never seems quite real to us. So we, we live our life. In, in the in the dilute, we live our life as if we are going to live forever, even though we all know we're not going to live forever. Is that due, due to the not of the of the body and consciousness? Like yeah, the, yeah. sometimes when we have a disease and we feel we fear like something we yes. can die. Because why we fear? Because we're so strongly identified with the body. So yeah. all the problems come down to it. This is what Bhagavan was repeatedly stressing whatever problems we face, ultimately, all problems, the root of all problems is this Dehatma Buddhi, this De, Dehabi Mana, this, this identification of ourself with a, a body. Because we take this body to, uh, to be ourself, all problems arise. And so I've... in order to be free of all problems, we need to separate ourselves from this body. Since the very nature of ego is to be aware of itself as I am this body, separating ourselves from this body is possible only by investigating ego. I say this body because if, even if we are forcibly separated from this body by death, we will grasp some other body which will take to be I. So the, the story continues until we are willing to let go of all bodies, give ourselves wholly to God. And what is it very interesting, Michael, is that uh, we can think that the reason for what uh, we usually think that uh, we we never die, no, yes. is, for, is for this very strong identification with the body, no. Yes. But um, there is another thing that um, I uh, I think 
um, uh, we can feel clear, no, in ourselves, yeah. no. Is the evocation of the eternity of our re our real nature, no? Yeah. Because uh, the, the 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 thing the thing because we we think that we never die is yeah. because in in the profound we know about our eternity, no. Yes. Is it uh, not two things, no, in parallel? Yes, yes, no? yes, yes, yes. That is, we seem to be mortal because we seem to be this body, but at the same time, the uh, that fundamental awareness, our own existence, I am, is so so real. We we cannot conceive of a state in which we are not. Because hmm. even to conceive of that state, we must be there to conceive it. So, it, there there cannot be a state in which we are not. That somehow we have a we have a deep um, a deep Intuition. recognition of that. Even though we are not we 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 are not clearly aware of ourselves as we actually are. We can. That is the thing about ego. We are never ignorant. We always know I am. The problem is, though we know that we are, we don't know what we are because we mistake I am to be something other than what it is. So this um, ego always has this element of reality in it, this awareness I am. And we all recognize that I is real. But because we take the body to be I, the body seems to be real and therefore seems to be immortal. So we, our state is, is, is a confusion, but that confusion arises not because we have ever lost that fundamental awareness I am, because we mistake it to be something other than what it actually is. We mistake the rope to be a snake. All problems arise because of the snake. But, but the rope is harmless. It, and the rope doesn't do anything. It never actually becomes a snake. It just remains as it is. But because of the because we mistake it to be something other than what it is, all the problems arise. Likewise, because we mistake ourselves to be something other than what we actually are, it is said that we are ignorant. We are not actually ignorant. We, uh, well, or what is called ignorance is nothing but a, a wrong knowledge of ourself, a false identification. And all problems arise out of that false identification. So the case with uh, as I said, the, the case with hypochondria, in, when nothing is threatening our life and we feel we fear that we're going to die, like uh, just out of the blue, just out of <laughs> without without any reason. Yeah, that yeah, is, yeah. That's like a, an old a, a, a I don't know a reminder that we are ident misidentifying with this body. Yes, yes, yes. And that is hypochondria arises because of too much concern about this body. So we, we, the hypochondriacs not only fear death, they fear being sick. They may be perfectly healthy, but they'll be imagining that they're sick exactly. because they have so much, they're so afraid of, of sickness that it causes them to imagine that they're sick, even when they're not sick. Mm -hmm. But all, all, whatever problems we think of, whatever problems anyone faces in life, it all comes down to eventually this this false identification because we we have risen as ego and the nature of ego is to always uh, to always be aware of itself as i am this body i am this person all problems thereby ensue because once we impose limitations on ourselves there's so many dangers so many nothing all certainty goes once we limit ourselves as a body because nothing about this, this bodily life is certain. The next moment we may have a heart attack or a stroke or something and die or be in permanent paralysis or anything can happen at any time. So we, we, by embracing this body as I, we are embracing uncertainty. The only certainty we're embracing is that we're going to die if this body is I. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that is the same reason why we feel that we are the same, uh, the same over the years. Like, uh, yes, I mean, yes, our body changes, our mind changes, our opinion, our likes. Yeah, 
but we feel I'm the same. Yeah, yeah. Because of that element also. In, in the eyes of others, we may be a decrepit old man. <laughs> but in our view, no, I'm the same. I'm the same fellow who was running around as a 10 year old boy playing football and everything. So we never actually feel old. We're, we're aware the body is becoming creaky and not so. <laughs> it's and not you try as to it run. Was, and you try to run. Are, I am still <laughs> the same eye. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we feel like we even we, we haven't changed. Or yes. Yes. Our body. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Change is obvious that we have gained weight or yeah, have wrinkles or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the mind has gone undergone so many changes. What mm. we believed and what we what we wanted yeah. when we were five years old or ten years old is completely different to all our all our beliefs and our desires and so on now. But still, we're the same eye. So the one continuity is I. Everything else is changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's true that it's like a, I mean, we know it very unconsciously. It's like a very uh, far away intuition or. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Because it is, uh, we're not pure enough. Yes. Yeah, in our minds. Mm -hmm. And, and this, uh, this certain, this uh, conviction, no, inside uh, and and make strong this conviction about our eternity. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you became more con conscious of your, our real nature, no? Yes. It's a, a, a very good um, partner of journey, no? Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel from my, my childness, no? When I yeah. my child, childhood, no, childhood, sorry, yes. childhood, <laughs> I always feel that I will not die. What I really yeah. are, no. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Michael, one, uh, I guess it's because in Tamil there are no articles, right? No, you, the, you translated who have intense fear of death, not an intense fear of death. Is that because in Tamil there are no articles? You well. You, You can say in Tamil, you, there is a word, uh, oru, which means one, or or, if it's before a verb, um, that, that can mean one. So that is sometimes used in the sense of, a similar sense to the indefinite article in English, but there's no definite articles. Um, and here, he, he, he... You don't want to quantify. No? It, it wouldn't be natural to say... Uh, and here it would be don't who have intense fear of death that kind of fear yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah i mean in english it wouldn't be unnatural to say who have a, an intense fear of death but in tamil if you were to say oru maruna by uh, one fear of death it would look very unnatural oh, yeah it's true yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's true mm -hmm. yeah and the 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 last sentence where it says, uh, who are deathless be as associated with the thought of death is, uh, they won't have the thought of yeah, death. Yeah, that, that's what it means. That's what it means. Um, won't, because won't Bhagavan is, is, um, is using the same verb, the same verb that he uses for taking refuge. He also mm -hmm. uses that verb for um, taking refuge in the feet. He also will be... It's because the same verb can have different meanings in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it basically means that they won't have this thought again. Yes, yes. Well, and they won't be they anymore. No, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> if they are not they, they won't have any thoughts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so. That is the verb he uses here is sa. And sa means to reach, to approach. To depend upon, take shelter in, to be near, to be associated or connected with, to unite, to be related, yeah. or to resemble or be equal, or to lean upon or recline against. So it has it has a range of meanings. So what exactly it means depends upon the context. So in this case, it, it um, in in the In the first case, in the first use of the verb, which is they 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 reach the feet of Mahasan, their uh, reach means 
they take refuge. It's in that sense that it's used. Uh, then in the um, in the next sentence, in the last sentence, uh, reach the thought of death means they won't be associated with. They won't have that fear of death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the exact meaning of the word is uh, is dependent on the context. The context and yeah. in the second verse, uh, second sentence, he uses um, a noun form of the uh, verb sa. He says savu. Savu in this context it means surrender, but the usual meaning of savu it, it can mean a place or residence. It can mean um, a refuge. It can mean a basis, it can mean a help or support, it can mean a means, it can mean attachment, it can mean vicinity. It doesn't directly mean surrender, but in this context, taking refuge means surrendering. So in, by, by, by extension, sabu here implies by, by surrender, though it literally means by refuge. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we consider how Bhagavan uses the word sabu here, uh, sa, the verb sa and the noun savu, which in this context, in the first sentence, um, the, uh, the, the verb, and in the second sentence, the noun form of this word, they both mean refuge, superficially. But what does taking refuge mean? Taking refuge means we, we truly take refuge in God only by giving ourselves wholly to him. That is by surrendering. So though the... the the literal meaning is refuge, taking refuge, or uh, the, the implied meaning is surrender. So like this in so many places, Bhagavan uses very simple language. We have to understand not only the meaning of the words, we have to understand the implication of the words. So the, the meaning of this verse is clear only if we view it in the context of his teachings as a whole. What he means by taking refuge is surrendering. And what he means by surrendering is turning within and merging back into our source. That's the only way we can give ourselves wholly to God. As he says in the first sentence of the, um, of the uh, 13th paragraph of Nana, um, I won't say the exact meaning, but the implied meaning is, what he implies in that sentence is, being so keenly self-attentive that one thereby gives no room to the rising of any other thought is giving oneself to God. So the true surrender is possible only by turning our entire attention within. Because only when we turn our entire attention within will ego subside and merge back into its source. So we have to read beyond the words to understand the implication, and we will understand the implication correctly only if we view it in the light of Bhagavan's teachings as a whole. This is why it's very important to have a, a comprehensive and coherent understanding of Bhagavan's teachings. His teachings are very simple, so it's not difficult, but we need to, we need to understand the fundamentals. Then everything else becomes clear. So, though the language of this verse is very, very different to the language of the previous verse, in both verses, he's essentially talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. But we can see that only if we understand his teachings correctly, if we understand what he is implying by the words he uses. Mm 